say it together. This is a new year. Let's proclaim it now. I believe this is the perfected word of God. I believe that in the volume of this book speaks about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I desire not only to read it, to know it, but through the power of God's Holy Spirit to live it. Amen? Amen. And help me always. Amen. Lord bless your word. Open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I started this chapter, and we'll read the first four verses, which we taught on last week, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, by the way, if you ever want to just view the studies again, you can view it on YouTube. Uh, Jim back there, he records Sundays and Wednesdays. Either go to PastorJim.com and, and look at the, uh, on the website there, and uh, resources and so forth, but down the media. Or if you're not that high tech, you just go to YouTube. If you have YouTube, just type in CCJV, and more than likely will be will pop up there. So you can view the studies there if you like and get familiar. So verse one it says, "Let not your heart be troubled." Remember, he's talking to his disciples. This chapter kind of does a transition now that he's going to be more intimate and focused to his disciples as he prepares for the cross, his death, and of course his resurrection. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, we had some great teaching on that last week. What is the Father's house? And what is his mansion? And we, we also looked at 1 Thessalonians, uh, reflecting that when Jesus says, I'll come and get you again and receive you unto myself, how that coincides with the rapture of the church. Uh, the Lord is coming to take his church back. And we pick up this morning in verse 5 as we continue. Thomas, listening to these words of Jesus, says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? In other words, how do we get to the Father's house, Lord? You know, I, I'm so sorry to say, I'm sad to, to even say this, but not anyone's going to go to the Father's house. And a lot of people think that they're just going to get there by some type of merit or religious status. You don't get there by any ways of that. I wish I could say that all God's creation will end up at the Father's house, but that's just not so. There's too many people still rebelling against God. And so many people just resist to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're believing religion, they're believing cults, occults, they're believing different philosophies of people, and, and they're just not accepting the Bible, which is the absolute truth we're going to see in. But because of the rebellion of people, many will not enter the kingdom of God. You know, I was in this store the other day, shopping, you know, and it's just it's crazy in, in, in some of these shopping centers. But I, I looked around and and I, I just pondered in my heart, Lord, how many of these people here shopping know you as a Savior? And I would imagine that probably the majority of the people do not know Jesus Christ. As we walk into the shopping centers and the malls and the stores, you know, people that walk by you, do you realize that without Christ, those people walking to their eternal salvation, I mean damnation, because they don't have Jesus Christ? This is why I'm privileged at Calvary Chapel that we can open these doors almost pretty much five to six days a week with teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why Calvary Chapel Sunday morning, when you come here, not a lot of bells and whistles, we preach the word. I want you, first of all, if you know God, God says, educate my people, equip them, that they can go out of these doors and share the gospel to people they love, their family, their wives, their husbands, their children, their acquaintances, whatever it would be. We open up the doors for so if you're here today and maybe you don't know Jesus Christ, to share the gospel with you, to give you an opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ. The fact is, God's real. What you believe doesn't change who God is. What your philosophy doesn't change salvation in Jesus Christ. And I would hate for you to risk your death to the nation because you think God is not real or that you don't need Jesus Christ. There's only one way to the Father's house. And we're going to see that in just a minute. Because I hear many people say, well, you know what, Jim? I'm glad that's good for you. I'm, I'm glad you're reading the Bible. I'm glad. But I really believe, you know what, Jim, that, uh, that no matter what, no matter what God you worship and what God you serve, 
It all leads to God. It all leads to heaven. Well, I just want to tell you, that is absolutely not true. That is not in my Bible. My Bible does not teach that in any way. Matter of fact, my Bible teaches in Proverbs 14, 12, this is the word of God, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Again, in the Word of God, we read in Matthew 7, 13. Listen to this. This is Jesus speaking. And about a narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, difficult is the way, which leads to light, and there are few who enter it. How sad that kid. Think about it. It's broad is the way. Many people in this world are, are going to hell by other means than Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ is a very narrow-minded person. And I'm glad I'm narrow-minded with him. Amen. Jesus Christ says there's only one way, and that's it. Well, you're narrow-minded. Well, no, that's what God says. And since God created the universe, you know how big the universe is, right? No. Realize? Billions of stars out there, billions of galaxies out there. Do you know our little galaxy that we live in, we think it's huge, billions of stars, and look at Mars, how big it is, and all Pluto, and all that. You know, you can take our universe, and some of the stars God created, you can literally put our universe inside one star. That's how big the stars are out there. You know, God created them. God started them all. And you know what's amazing? He named every one of them. Every one of them, billions of them. And then we ask, does God know me? <laughs> He knows every star by name. You don't think he knows you? He told me, Jim. I remember when I used to, not used to Dell, but you know, you have those moments like, God, really, will you, can you do this, can you do this? He goes, Jim, I'll tell you what, my thought towards you are more than you can imagine. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'll tell you what, go to the beach, pick up a hand of sand, and drop that sand and count every grain of sand that's in your hand. He goes, I have more thoughts of you than the grains of sands on the beach. Amen. Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's impossible. Well, of course, for well, you finite little minds. It's impossible. You couldn't count every grain in the sand. Anyway, but you know, this is showing you how much Yahshua. God, Messiah, Savior, King, Lord, Prince of Peace. He is the God of the universe, and He is your God. And He came down to save you, to have a relationship with you. Isn't that incredible? And see, so Thomas is like looking at Jesus, and you know, Jesus is talking about the Father's house, and you know, where you go, you can't come right now, and so forth. You know, and, and so Thomas, you know, you know we kind of, Discredit Thomas. You know, we call him Delling Thomas because, you know, he didn't believe Jesus rose from the dead. But he's a man that just <laughs> likes to inquire. Matter of fact, he's the guy that's going to learn something because he's always the one asking the questions. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how you learn. You ask questions. And he did the same thing here. He was honest. He wanted to know. In other words, Thomas is saying, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. You know, we have to... You know, I have to confess, Lord, I'm ignorant about this. I just don't understand. What do you mean where you're going, we can't come? And Jesus says to him, and please, if you're here this morning, listen up. Get an understanding of this truth, because it can define your eternal destination. Whether you believe it or not, it's a fact. And we see in Jesus, Jesus says in verse 6, Well, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. There's no talking about many ways here. Jesus says, I just want you to know there's many truths and there's many ways, and I just want you to know I'm one of them. He doesn't go down that road. There's only one way. He is the only way. I'm so thankful that God revealed that to me. Even in the midst of my bad lifestyle and drugs, he reveals himself to me and bring me to a place that I had to just look up. I was so, so down, I, there's no place that I could to look up with my drugs and my uh, uh, dealing in, in jail, just on and on and on. Matter of fact, I can't wait, I'm hoping, I thought it would be January, but I was telling Paul, probably February, you know, I'm going to be sharing my, my total testimony I got a book back out there, but I got, I want to share my testimony. I haven't done that in years. And so the most excellent way 
is going to sponsor me for three nights uh, here, probably on a Friday or something or Sunday, and share my life with where I came from, what God did to me, and how I got in the pulpit. And let me tell you, it's all about Jesus. There's so much hope in Jesus you can't even imagine. You say, I, God does, doesn't know me. God knows you. He created you. He knows every aspect of your life. God would never accept me. That's your thought. That's not God's thought. He sent his son to die for you. Don't tell me God won't accept you. Don't tell me God can't change you. I mean, if I ask anybody, we could be here five hours sharing testimony, the miraculous workings of God in our lives. And this is why we want people to know what he can do. No one comes to the Father except for me, Jesus says. There's only one way, Jesus says, and I'm it. There is none other name under heaven, the Bible teaches, given among men, whereby we must be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. We must be saved. He's not just showing the way. He's not pointing. He is the way, personally. He is the way. No church, no ceremony, no merits, no money, no religious status. None of these things can get you to God. But only Jesus Christ. Only Christ can bring you to God. He is the way. Either you have Christ or you don't have Christ. Either you trust Him or you don't. Or you're a Christian. Well, you know. What do you mean, well, you know? I don't know. <laughs> You know, when people tell me, are you a Christian? It's like they're telling yourself, well, I think I am. <laughs> you don't know if you're a Christian or not. Are you been born again? Well, my mother gave birth in 1946. <laughs> I said, yeah, you've been rotten ever since. <laughs> but you've been born again by God. What does that mean? Then you're not a Christian. See, God doesn't want lukewarm, hot or cold, brother. You either win or whether you're not. Today, you either have them or you don't have them. You don't say, well, you know, I was been with in church all my life. Oh, wow. You know what Gregory always say? You know, go to McDonald's, doesn't make a hamburger. Right? It, it doesn't matter if you're in church. You know, well, I come to church a lot. Big deal. I like to see you on the freeway. How do you respond then? What happens when you and your wife fight? What happens when your kids tell you, I hate you, you old man? You go, well... God loves you. <laughs> Let me just pray for you, son, before you kill him. <laughs> the question is, do you understand? Do you come to have you come to the acknowledgement of him? You know that you're, you're, you're willing to trust, you're willing to believe in him. See, that's what faith is all about, is believing in the creator of the universe. It's believing it's the one that can hold the stars in the universe and the rotation of our sun and our moon. You know that the sun that doesn't come three, de three degrees closer, it said it fry us. Three degrees further from the sun will send us into the ice age. God miraculously put the sun right where it should be, the moon right where it should be for our tides and for our gravity and so forth. God planted this earth specifically for His creation, which is us. And because we blew it, God sent salvation. Amen. From the very beginning, when Adam and Eve blew it, He already says that your heel shall crush the head of Satan. Showing about Jesus Christ, hanging on that cross. All for you. Don't doubt God. Believe God. Don't question Him. Trust Him. Amen. Bring all your tears to Him. Bring all your anxieties for Him. Because the Bible says He desires to care for you. Amen. Let all your requests made known to Him. Even though before you ask, He knows what you have need of. He says, still pray and come to me. He wants you to have a relationship with Him. He wants you to see how wonderful and gracious and loving He is towards you in the spite of all the things that we may falter and fail in. <coughs> this is why if you have Christ, if you have Jesus Christ, then you're headed to the Father's house. You're headed to that place because Jesus says, if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto what? Myself. Now, we, we taught on that last time, and that's reflecting 1 Thessalonians. It's kind of like a commentary. He's talking about the rapture. 
He's gone to prepare a place for us. He's coming again in the clouds to call his church home. And someday that could take place. Are you ready? Will you be snatched away? Will you be taken out of this world before the great tribulation starts? When will that day come? Well, you know, only I know the day now. So if you want to know, I'll let you know. I can't tell you I don't know the day in the hour. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice though? Yeah. I better be our church to be filled. I'm the only one God told me when he's coming, so if you hear it, I can't call the occasion. <laughs> no one knows when he's coming, right? Oh, yeah. But we're waiting with anticipation day by day until he comes, right? Yeah. I, I pray you're not just sitting in the pews. I pray you're getting out there and sharing the gospel with people. This is what I'm trying to train you to do, teach you to do. Share the love of God. He loves you. You love him. Let people know that. You know what? How many people know I love my wife? How do you feel? Well, let the other people know. I talk about her a lot. After 50 years, I got a lot to talk about. You know, but she has a lot to talk about. But we love each other. If I didn't love my wife, if I said I love my wife and I never mentioned her, never bring her around. Wow, oh, how's your wife Elaine? Who? <laughs> oh, 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 you mean I'm one that washes my clothes. Well, she does a good job. Oh, you mean one that cooks. Yeah, you know, sometimes she burns me. But other than that, it's okay. No. I want you to know I love my wife. I'm not embarrassed of her. I'm not ashamed of her. I hug her in public. I kiss her in public. I talk to her in public. I am not ashamed of my wife, so I should not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. God who loves you so dearly and loves you so much. And go out and tell the world this. You know, Jesus says, I am the truth. Not only is he the life, he's the way I mean, but he is the truth. He's not saying that he tells the truth. You know, I want you to know I'm an honest man. He is the truth. He is the standard of truth. He is the measurement of truth that we live on, the cornerstone. The absolute truth. When God speaks, you can believe it is the truth. When God says, I'll provide all your needs according to his riches and glory, he will do that if you trust in him. If God says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you, which is your clothes, your food, your raiment, and so forth, he will do that as absolute truth. But we also got to realize this truth is that if you don't accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you won't go to heaven. That's truth. Jesus says, I'm the way to truth and life. There's no other way to heaven. That is the absolute truth. And we got to believe that. When God says, don't be unevenly yoked, he's telling you, you're going to have a problem if you do that. That's the truth. Don't do that. When God says, do not commit fornication, don't do that. It's a sin against God, and it's going to affect you personally. It's going to hurt you. These are the truths of the Word of God. If God says, I go away, prepare a place for you, come again. He says, if it were not so, I would tell you. In other words, he's saying it. If I, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to persuade. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm going away, prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again, and I will get you, if you are a child of God, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So you've got to consider that. He says, I'm the life. He's not simply a life. He's the source of it. He's the origin of it. In the very beginning of this gospel, we started off that way. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Listen, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Everything was made. It's not the Big Bang Theory. It's not evolution. You're not made out of the ooze of the mud and developed into who you are. God created you, everyone unique. You know, every one of us have different fingerprints. Amazing. Do you know that snow is made out of snowflakes? One little snowflake? And do you realize that every snowflake that falls is unique? There's not one snowflake alike. I mean, I guess it's a matter we go, can God do that? You really think God can heal me? Hmm. Yes. I don't know. Of course He can. 
Amen? Amen. People come and go, you know, what about those when God the resurrection, when we're cremated, we're ashes? Well, you know what? You were dust when you first created you guys. Right? At least the woman came out of the rib. Guys, we were dirt. You wonder why they don't eat you. Came out there. Did you ever hear that, you know, that joke that little girl run to her mom? Oh, mom, mom, come in my bedroom, come in my bedroom, quick, quick, quick. And she comes in her bedroom, she goes in the bedroom, and there's a clot of dust. And she goes, Look at mom, he's creating another man. <laughs> this is what God does, man. So you don't think he can do something now? You don't think he can change your life now? Why were you sinners? He died for you? I'll tell you, you know? No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus made a dead end street for any cult, any ism, anything else. That's dead end. So you need to realize that tomorrow. Morning. And we who believe need to realize that too. You know, and after Thomas' statement, you know, responding, Jesus responding to him that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and nowhere it comes except through the Father. No one comes here. Jesus continues his thought and said in verse 7, If you have known me, Thomas, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Thomas may have doubts right now, but Jesus is telling him, you will understand, Thomas, as many of us understand now, truly, who the father is through Jesus Christ. And I pray you, you understand that. I pray you understand that, that the father is only known through Jesus Christ. Amen. You can't know God the father without Jesus Christ. Christ is the express, express image of our Father. You know, I ask people sometimes, I say, I wonder what the Father's like. I, I, I wish I understood better what God wants in my life and so forth. And they go on all these questions. I'm just telling you, you want to know those questions? Simple. Read the Gospels. Read about Jesus Christ and you'll get an understanding of who God is and how much He does love you and what His purpose is for you in His life. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given to all of us that is all of us who's coming to the knowledge of Christ as a Savior. He's not giving it to the world. He's giving it to His children, to all things that pertain to life and godliness. This is how I've learned now to live a life full of God and how to live godly. Because God has given me all that I need pertaining to life and godliness. And it's through the knowledge of Him, Jesus, who called us to glory and virtue. See, at the couple's retreat, we're going to be sharing some of the knowledge of God, what it is to have and love your wife and your husband. We're going to teach you through the Word of God how you can still have conflicts and arguments in marriage and still live a joyous, wonderful, happy marriage. It's going to be a wonderful thing because it's all through what we're going to share according to God's Word if we take care. Now, in the midst of the conversation, Philip is there. He's listening to all this. And he's listening to Thomas's question. So Philip says, listen, but he interrupts. And then we see in verse 8, Philip says to Jesus, well, Lord, show us the Father. And that will suffice us. You show us that. Well, Jesus responds to him as it is to us. He said to him, Philip, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say Show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, Philip. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Now we need to understand the unity of the Father and the Son doesn't involve just a thought that the Father and the Son is exactly the same person. They're not. They're unique in person. They're the triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one God. It was Joseph uh, Cook. He said this. It's so good. He said, The Father without the Son and the Holy Spirit would not be God in His fullness. He also said the Son, Jesus, without the Father and the Holy Spirit would not be God likewise. And also the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, without the Father and the Son would not be God. But the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together are one God in three blessed glorious, loving persons. Isn't that amazing? You got all three on your side. Amen. 
You know, it, it's not Steve Fon that holds you in your hand. It is Jesus Christ. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not the Father saying, you know what, I love them, I love them. It's not Jesus going, well, you know, I love them more. I went down the earth and I lived with them. Believe me, that's a toughie. I mean, you know, Father, you didn't go living with them for 33 years. I lived with them. So I love them the most. And of course, the Holy Spirit spoke up. Oh, no, no, no. I love them the most. I got to be in them. I got to dwell with them until they're gloriously made perfected. No, it isn't like that. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit love you equally. They're separate people, one God, but they all love you together. They all have the same purpose and goal for you. They all want you to grow in His grace and in His knowledge. They all want you to be victorious in the battles of life. They all want you to be an overcomer to the attacks of the devil. All three of them united together, one God within us, getting us into heaven. Isn't that wonderful, Lord, you had feel so alone? Well, you got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll never leave you, I'll forsake you. Jesus here on earth, the man, Christ, and yet he was the Son of the Father. And the Father was with Jesus Christ, of course, because the Father is omnipresent. He's in the whole universe. He that seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. Believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. I speak not of myself, he says, but the Father dwell in me. He does the work. I am so thankful now that we have the Holy Spirit, and the God of heaven speaks to us. And it could be through his word. It could be through other Christians who maybe quote his word to you, or prophesy to you. It could be through just another pastor, evangelist, but God is always speaking to you. Always reminding you of His presence. Always encouraging you that someday He'll come and take you home. He's always telling you, endure until the end. And you'll receive the crown of righteousness. So He knows our hardships. He knows our struggles. He knows what we're going to go through in this world, in this life. So he's always telling us to stay faithful to him. Three separate persons, triune God. Verse 13, it says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sakes of the works themselves. He's challenging you. If you just can't believe in, you know, and, and my declarations, me just telling you who I am, then believe in the, in the very works that I do that I do in the name of the Father in heaven. And then he goes on, and I, I'm thinking of Jesus talking about his works. I can just imagine him talking to his disciples and saying, did any man ever do the works that I have done? Really, think about it. Has any man ever been able to accomplish what Jesus has done? No matter what godly man has said, what religion has said, have they ever got even close to the works of our Lord Jesus Christ. Has any man had ever touched a leopard back then, he would have been defiled. But Jesus says, when I touch him, and when I say, be thou clean, my hands are not defiled, my hands are not filled with leprosy, but I heal the man that was defiled of leprosy, that clinged to him. That leprosy didn't cling to me, but I healed him. And isn't that like our sins? That God has healed us of our sins. And he hung all those sins on the cross. And now he came off the cross as the holy, perfect, perfected one. And us in Jesus Christ are healed of our past sins. Don't let your past sin dictate or define you. What defines you is who you are in Jesus Christ. Don't let your mistakes and your shortcomings and your failures define you. This is part of life. Who gets angry? I mean, I'm an Italian. I get angry. Amen? So who sins? Who says things you wish you never did? Who kicked your dog? <laughs> That's pretty low if you did, I'm glad nobody raised it. Now, who kicked their cat? I 
have a bingo card. See, we are all imperfect. For you to say that God can't correct and make me all that He wants me to be, you're fighting against the most powerful force in the universe. And that's God. Because in spite of what you think of yourself, God can create better. And He doesn't want you where you're at. He wants you to grow every day better and better. Glory to glory. Faith, faith. He wants you more like Him. And you know what? I want to become more like the God I worship. Jesus says, what man has ever stood on water or walked on water? What man has ever looked at the storms of the sea and said, be still? And they stopped. He looked at the ground. And man sows the seeds and cultivates the ground. And eventually through the mercy of God, because God brings sunshine, God brings rain. You know, and God created these incredible chemicals in the ground where a seed is planted and it dies and yet it comes forth out of the ground as sod in the, in the sod and, and the earth brings forth the grain which can make the bread and the man does all that. But what man can take two fish and one loaf of bread and feed 5,000 people? Jesus Christ. See, I'm saying all this because I want you to know God demonstrated His works and His powers that we would believe, that we would realize there's nothing God can't do. Yeah. It says, what's impossible for God? Absolutely nothing. Our problem is we don't have the patience to wait on God when we ask for God's touch or healing in our lives. We want it right away. We want it within a month or six months or a year. I don't know how long God will say. It might take, you know... A month, it might take years. We see in the Bible that Greg taught that the nation of Israel were captured by Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylon society. But God told them in 70 years, you'll be set free. And so what he was saying is, tell your children, plant great vineyards, have peace in that land you're in. But tell your children, there's a day coming of deliverance. And you know what? I already been delivered, but I want to make sure my children and my grandchildren and anybody else who hear that there's a hope and there's a deliverance and it's available to them right now. And it's in Jesus Christ. He can take you on the darkness and he makes a light. He's the one that can feed. He's the one that can do all that we can imagine. Verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater than these he will do, because I am my Father. Now, he's not talking about material here. He's talking about spiritual. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm limited. I'm only here three years. But when I go and bring the comfort, and we're going to be teaching on that soon, he'll send the comfort on to us, the counsel that's with us now. That we can do greater works. What greater work? Get the gospel out. Bring people to Christ. People, this is our purpose here. You're ambassadors of the Lord. Go out and represent Him rightly. Tell people how much you love Him. Let them know that there's a hope in Jesus Christ because we have no hope in the world. And we're going to see that in Acts likewise. When the Holy Spirit came and Peter preached and 3,000 came, this is what he's talking about. Greater works you'll do. In other words, in the spiritual sense, because I'll be gone, but I will send you to comfort, and now you will pass the baton, and you will go out and spread the gospel. That's why he says, you know, go out to the other most parts of the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. And whatever you ask in my name, verse 13, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now please, let me get this very clear. You can't ask anything in the name of Jesus. So don't go out and ask for your Cadillacs and your Mercedes Benz, your, you know, your great big fishing boat and all that good stuff. You know, It amazes me that God and people go, I pray. I went out and bought five lottery tickets. And I pray that God will let me win so I can build Jim a church. I'll probably never see you again. But that probably won't happen. God, I don't think that's all in God. He said, don't search for riches. Don't go out and seek riches. Oh, Lord, I pray. Father, you know I desire a good thing for you. So as I eat this banana split, 
Let the calories just dissipate. And let it not be added to my stomach always. I don't think that might happen. I don't think that happen. You reap what you sow. You eat our bananas bread, watch out, man. It's coming. You know, it will catch up to you. You know, this, this holiday season, you know, it's like I woke up one day and just went bloop.
Let your love show forth to our family, our life, our husbands and wives and children, and to those around us. And as we leave this facility, dear Father, let us not forget we're entering the mission fields out into the world. And we look to you for that strength. And we pray in Jesus' name. And we all agree and say, Amen. While we all stand, don't forget meetings, our leadership meeting right after the service, probably about 1130. God bless you, Lord be with you, and protect you, and have a blessed day.